Loving Sai Realms, everyone. Before we begin our YA program, I'd like to start with three Oms and welcome Bhagwan to our program. My loving salutations at the divine lotus feet of our sweet and loving Lord, Sri Satya Sai Baba. Bhagwan, we offer this YA program to your divine lotus feet and we pray that you will enjoy it. And Bhagwan, we pray for love and light to all the beings in all the world. A very warm welcome to our respected elders, brothers and sisters, children, and all the viewers here today from the West Indies, Canada, and across USA. Wishing everyone a very, very happy, holy, and sacred Christmas. Today, I am delighted to introduce you to two wonderful YAs that exude the very quality that Jesus came to teach us, and that is of selfless love. Jesus taught us that two wrongs don't make a right, that if someone should slap your cheek, then offer them the other cheek. And on a deeper level, he was teaching us that if someone should criticize you or hurt you, then don't retaliate, don't try and hurt them back, just love them back. No need, no need for anything else. That is your duty to love, love, love. And our sweet Lord has told us to live our life just like Jesus did. Baba said that from the beginning, Jesus was a pure and selfless, constantly loving person who unselfishly dedicated his every action to the good of the world. He told us emphatically in numerous discourses, be like Jesus. And on this holy and sacred Christmas holiday, we celebrate the birth of Christ within our hearts, meaning the birth of selfless love, peace and joy. And so let's practice at least one of these teachings as Bhagwan has instructed. Today, our YAs will discuss the deeper meaning of Christmas and the importance of Christ as guided by Swami's own discourses, and then they will tie that back to their own personal experiences. So without much further ado, let me share who our loving angels are. They are India and Ananda Gonzalez. India is currently an active young adult at the Satya, Satya Sai Center of Manhattan, and India received her Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University and her Master of Fine Arts, specifically in creative writing from NYU. She currently works as the assistant editor at Poets and Writers Magazine. India's spirituality and love for Swami is the very cornerstone of everything she does in life. Anana Gonzalez was born into the Seifold as well and is a graduate of South Bedsetter's SSE program. She carries both a BA and a Master of Fine Arts from Columbia University in poetry and fiction, respectively. In addition to writing, she is also a professional dancer, choreograph choreographer, and filmmaker. Ananda is grateful to have found a home as a YA in the Manhattan Sci Center and feels immensely blessed to travel through life with Swami as her guide, protector, and best friend. I know you are going to absolutely love our YAs and their offering. Now over to you, sisters, Jay Sai Ram. Sai Ram, everyone. My sister Indy and I would first like to begin by thanking Geetha Auntie for such a sweet introduction. We are incredibly honored to be here today, blessed with the opportunity to speak about Christmas as we celebrate the auspicious birth of our dear Jesus Christ. Before we begin, we pray that Swami guides our every thought and word, working through us entirely as we offer this talk at his divine lotus feet. 
Now, Christmas is a beautiful time of the year in which many of us celebrate by decorating a tree, giving and receiving gifts, spending time with family and loved ones, and hopefully getting a chance to relax while enjoying home-cooked meals in the process. I know that throughout both of our lives, this is certainly how we've always celebrated this holiday within our family. And as children especially, Christmas morning held a lot of joy and excitement for us as we were always eager to finally unwrap the presents under the tree. But throughout our lives, Christmas has also inspired us to perform more seva. As the need of many for food and a warm, safe place to rest becomes even more apparent and urgent, December is also a time in which many of us, we know this to be true, find new ways to serve within our communities. So for us, this holiday has also been steeped in this emphatic spirit of service and generosity as well. And for a little bit more information about us, our mother grew up in a Baptist church before she met Swami, and our father grew up in a Catholic household. So more or less, Christianity has always been somewhat a part of our lives, even from a very young age. But funnily enough, as Swami would have it, we can very honestly say that it wasn't until we began to prepare for this talk that we realized how little we actually knew about Jesus. Mm. So we are now doubly grateful for this opportunity to speak on Christmas because in putting together this presentation, we've been left in awe of Jesus's divine life. And by becoming more acquainted with his story, we also have begun to fall in love with all that he represents and is. We have been blessed to now see and understand Jesus as yet another manifestation and incarnation of our sweet Swami. So today, though we celebrate all the beautiful rituals of serving and gift giving that are often associated with Christmas, we'd like to spend the next 20 minutes or so moving beyond the ritual and digging deeper into the essence of Jesus and the significance of this holy day. I can think of no better start than to take a look at the meaning of Jesus and Christ as separate names and terms, and then to discuss their union with one another to create the figure Jesus Christ. The name Jesus means savior. How incredibly apt. A savior being a person who saves someone or something from danger. Jesus fulfilled his life's dharma as prophesied by his name alone, by sacrificing his very life to save mankind from ourselves to help show us the godly way of living. Now, since Jesus was first known as Jesus of Nazareth before he became Jesus the Christ, we also have to become better acquainted with the term Christ, which is derived from the Greek word Christos, meaning anointed or the anointed one. It is identical to the Hebrew word Messiah. If we look further at the definition of anointed, it means to make sacred or to dedicate to the service of God. What's also interesting is that Christ doesn't necessarily point to one specific being, as every anointed being is therefore Christed. This is to say, we can all become Christ-like by making our hearts and lives sacred, and by dedicating ourselves to the Lord. When we bring Jesus and Christ together, what we're really saying is master of love, or universal love. So we're really talking about God directly. And of course, this makes sense since Jesus' life journey was that of going from the statement, I am the messenger of God, to I am the son of God, and eventually arriving at, I and my father are one, where he could no longer distinguish between himself and God, thus attaining that pure state of non-dualism, enlightenment. As we all know, on December 25th, the auspicious day when Jesus was born, three kings came to his birthplace, and each king said something different regarding the newborn. One king said, this child looks like one who will be a lover of God. The second king said, God will love this child. And the third king declared, this child is God himself. As Swami has told us, the first king viewed Jesus from the physical point of view, the second from the mental point of view, and the third from the atmic point of view. These three declarations indicate how one can progress from the human to the divine level. Jesus himself has said, you know that all my life was one great drama for the sons of men, a pattern for the sons of men. I live to show the possibilities of man. This is yet another way of making known the love Jesus has for each of us. He was full of so much divine love, he is universal love after all, that he lived out a tremendous drama, full of naysayers, criticism, misunderstanding, threats, 
and ultimately a crucifixion so that we too might shed the notion that we are only humans. And this drama of life that Christ speaks to, I'm also left thinking about the Ramayana and the Bhagavad Gita, the list goes on. How God reincarnates himself into so many different forms of the flesh so that we might learn from the story of his multiple births. The greatness of Christ's particular birth is that he was born a man and grew over time into his godhood. He was just like us in that way. These incarnations are very meaningful. These instances of the divine father and mother allowing itself to be exiled into the forest for 14 years or to be nailed hand and foot to a cross so that we might wake up from our daydreaming, from this Maya that surrounds us and drop into the real, the divine. In preparing this talk, Swami led us with his divine grace to the question, how can we awaken the Jesus within? Christmas could be a day that reminds us of our true destiny, our journey from humanity to divinity. And remembering what Jesus and Christ stand for separate words, savior and the anointed one. How can we be our own saviors? How can we anoint ourselves? We can use the day of Christmas as a spiritual check-in before the new year, where we often make resolutions to change for the better. We can use Christmas in a new way, perhaps, to ask ourselves honestly, what am I willing to do to move closer to God? Think of it as a head start on the new year. As Swami willed Christ to be born and gave a massive gift to all of humanity in return, what is it we want to give to Swami so that he can continue to chip away at us until the statue of our real self, our Christ self, is revealed? Christmas can become a day of recommitting ourselves to and being honest about where we are at in our spiritual journey of realizing our Christ consciousness. One important aspect to keep in mind as we choose to engage in this Christ journey and use his life as a means for better perfecting our own is that to spur our own anointment, we can't wait for Swami to change our hearts as we sit about idly or engaging in mere worldly pursuits. We must be willing to be the change we are looking for. We must be willing to take at least one step forward each day so that Swami can take a thousand more towards us. As we become our own saviors, so to speak, this inherently means we are acknowledging our inner divinity and power and no longer considering God as separate from ourselves. Absolutely. And speaking about the spiritual journey of every human being um, as embodied by the life of Jesus, as India said, as he transformed from man to the son of God to God himself, there is a beautiful term that encompasses this final union with God. And this term is Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness is essentially a state in which an individual achieves self-realization and unity with God. This term is synonymous with the concept of spiritual bliss that we often speak of. Christ consciousness is a term that was inspired by the spiritual elevation that Jesus achieved throughout his life, and it also celebrates the enlightenment attained by spiritual masters from all walks of faith especially after a period of suffering. What's most beautiful is that this term is not unique to Christianity. Christ consciousness exists within Buddhism as the term nirvana, the ultimate state of awakening that releases us from samsara. And it also exists within Hinduism as the term moksha, which we're all familiar with, where we emancipate ourselves from the maya that surrounds us and put an end to the karmic cycle of birth and death. So Christ consciousness is therefore not a Christian specific concept as this idea exists across many religions as it is the essential purpose of every faith to awaken one's own divinity and godlike nature through a path of love and surrender. Now to speak even more to the unity of all faiths, there is an interesting 16 year period of Jesus's life called his unknown years. Now, this portion of his life is undocumented in the Bible, but according to certain scrolls, Jesus left Jerusalem at the age of 13 and didn't return again until he was 29 years old. Now, admittedly, there is some debate about this specific time frame and how long Jesus's unknown years actually lasted for, but it is widely believed that during this time away from Jerusalem, he traveled across India, Tibet, Persia, Assyria, Greece, and Egypt, hoping to cultivate his divine abilities and discover his true divine identity. While moving through the Himalayas, he spent time in Tibetan monasteries, studying Buddhism from the great masters. 
and during his time in India, he studied the Vedas under Brahmin priests. Everywhere he traveled, he devoted himself to the religious practices and wisdom of that land, sitting at the feet of great mystics and spiritual teachers alike. Now, it's pretty incredible to think that Christ himself, the inspiration behind one of the most widespread religions in the world today, who was born a Jewish man, would then gain his spiritual powers and grow to realize his own divinity by traveling and learning from masters of many different religions outside his own. If Jesus had not moved beyond his own religious identity and sought the rich wisdom and experiences of so many other peoples and faiths, who knows if he may have not emerged as the loving savior we all know today. So as we celebrate his birthday, we are once again reminded of one of Swami's greatest and most central teachings, the unity of all faiths and more largely unity and diversity. We are lovingly reminded that in the realm of spirituality, there is no hierarchy. Each religion or spiritual practice is but a different pathway to the same mighty and merciful God. And each path holds a unique yet universal approach to returning to the self and awakening to our own divinity. So as we celebrate the life of Jesus today, Hopefully, we can also gain inspiration from his devotion to so many different faiths. And we too can move through our own spiritual journeys with the same sense of adventure, openness, and understanding of the oneness that lies beneath the multitude. As we continue to look at the life of Jesus and the many facets of it, let us not forget the sheer adversities he faced throughout his physical life. Christ's story was full of hardships until the very end. Similarly, walking the spiritual path is like walking through fire. It is quite literally a straightening out by fire, as some great spiritual figures say. It has also been said that if you ask for peace, God doesn't grant you peace, but a situation where your inner peace is required, meaning where your fear and anxiety are tested so that you are presented with the opportunity to let those false characteristics go. If we want to be fearless, peaceful, love-filled, and truthful, with the sweetest of cosmic humor, God will put us in situations where all those innate aspects of ourselves will be put to the test so we can come out victorious. Another way we can think of spirituality is as a series of deaths and rebirths. These deaths are spiritual. They are the letting go of identifying with the physical, with the ego, and remembering our true selves, our inner Atma. In the Bible, it is written that Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. We're talking about a constant spiritual death and rebirth as we step into our true forms. And the quicker we learn to let go and surrender to these spiritual deaths, the greater the rebirth, the easier it all becomes. We must sacrifice who we think we are to gain access to who we really are. After the Last Supper, before his crucifixion, Jesus went straight to the garden with his disciples and he prayed to his heavenly father in agony. During this intense prayer, his sweat was like drops of blood. He prayed to God saying, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. And what a cup of suffering it was. I am so moved by the sweat like drops of blood to foreshadow his future, the crown of thorns and the nails, the intensity of his prayer and the faith in a time of need. In this vulnerable moment in the garden, we see in the divine play just what allowing himself to be nailed to the cross meant to Jesus. He went through this stage and then ultimately prayed, I want your will to be done, not mine. He didn't ask God, his father, to take the eminent crucifixion away from him. He surrendered to God's will, which meant the ultimate sacrifice of his very life. That is a very special offering that can only come out of pure divine love and understanding. His India said, Jesus is undoubtedly an extraordinary example of retaining grace while moving through adversity. And he is also perhaps most well known for his spirit of sacrifice as evidenced by his crucifixion. The most famous image of Jesus and perhaps the image that probably comes to mind for most of us when we think about him is him being bound to the cross with a crown of thorns placed upon his head. 
He endured the hostility and betrayal of those surrounding him and ultimately sacrificed his body and very life out of love for all mankind. And even while nailed to the cross, Jesus looked upon Judas and the Romans, the very individuals responsible for his crucifixion, and he uttered the famous words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In this moment, despite his physical state of suffering and torment, Jesus looks upon the very people who seek to destroy him, and he pleads that God forgive them. He asks that God extend his grace upon them. These words and so much more establish Christ as the very embodiment of divine love. For his love was true and unconditional. He did not pick and choose who he loved or how he loved, but he freely extended his love to all, even those who sought to kill him. This exemplifies his understanding of the divine force that unifies us all, so much so that Jesus asked for God's forgiveness on behalf of others. In discussing the profound role of love in Jesus's life, there is a beautiful quote from a Christmas Day discourse Swami gave in 1992 where he says, man today worships inanimate idols and images, but makes no attempt to love his fellow human beings in flesh and blood. This was the first message of Jesus. Though one sees his neighbors day after day, he does not choose to love them. How can one believe that such a person can love an invisible God? If a man cannot love a fellow human being who is visible before his eyes, how can he love what is not visible to him. Love lies not only at the center of Jesus's life and message, but also at that of our beloved Swami too. Love is our natural state. It is who we are. It is the only force of energy moving through this world. And it permeates the entire universe moving through our cells and keeping us alive. The reality that we all know is that Christ consciousness or moksha can only be achieved through love. So today, we are blessed with the reminder that in order to open our hearts up to our dear Bhagavan, we must first open up our hearts completely to his earthly manifestations, to all the beautiful physical forms that surround us, ourselves included. We begin our journey to God by first learning to love his every creation, or by loving our neighbor, as Jesus said himself. In Swami's own words, the power of love is infinite it can conquer anything. While Jesus was famous for walking on water and Swami had the ability to materialize anything out of thin air, we too have the ability to perform miracles. If we possess the ability to love, we therefore possess the ability to soften even the coldest, prickliest, or most demonic heart. Love purifies the impure and has the power to alchemize and transform cruelty or harshness into love once more. The equation is simple. When love calls, love responds. So the miracle that we can perform every day in celebration of Jesus is the act of love. And our very ability to love is proof of our own divinity. Now, as our talk begins to wind down, I'll close by sharing a brief story about two particular instances that have taken place for me on Christmas day, two years in a row now. So two Christmases ago, on the night of Christmas Eve, I was, of course, sleeping, and I had a particularly vivid dream. Now, most of the time, I can't remember the entirety of my dreams, especially not without some great deal of effort on my part. But that night, every detail of this dream was so real and clear in my mind that I woke up, grabbed my phone, and began recording everything I could recall until I fell back asleep again. And when I awoke the next day, on Christmas morning, I looked at my phone, reread all the notes I'd taken in my half-conscious state, and realized that unbeknownst to me, I had written an entire short story in the middle of the night. <laughs> this might not seem miraculous to anyone, but I'll say here that uh, part of my dharmic duty in this life is to fulfill the role of a writer. And as a professional writer, I can honestly say that the process of creating is rarely ever this easy or smooth. It is even on the best of days, still arduous and demanding. And I say all this to say that prior to this Christmas Eve dream and midnight writing session, never in my life had a story flowed through me with so much ease. 
So I knew immediately that Swami had blessed me with that dream and he had used me as a vessel to record his story. And at the time, I hadn't given much thought to the timing of this personal miracle for me. That is, until the following year when Christmas rolled around again. Now this time, I didn't have a vivid dream. But as I began to wake up, a name out of nowhere popped into my head. And it was quite a strange name. And I kept thinking about this name. And so I realized that Swami was giving me the name of a character. So without speaking to anyone, on Christmas morning, I opened up my computer and began to write without much thought. I was just writing the words as they came to me. And after about 30 minutes of this, I stopped, reread everything, and realized that once again, I had written an entire short story on Christmas Day without any real effort on my part. Now, again, after years of writing, for a story to move through me with so much grace and immediacy was nearly unheard of. It was truly miraculous. So it was once more clear to me that Swami had blessed me with this story and with every word. And once again, I didn't have to do anything really. Swami dictated and I recorded. It was as simple as that. Now, who knows if this tradition will continue this Christmas, and who knows why these blessings took place on the auspicious occasion of Jesus' birthday, but I recognize it as the greatest gift to feel Swami working through me so directly, if even for a brief moment. And all I can think is that as we continue to move forward towards God, towards bliss and Christ consciousness, we also move closer to our true divine role as a neutral observer and witness. For two years in a row now, Swami has reminded me that if we lean into God, we'll realize there's nothing for us to do. We simply have to be, and everything else will fall into place. We cannot thank the respected members of the Global Council and Swami enough for working together in divine ordinance to offer us this immense blessing to reflect on and learn more about Jesus Christ and his significance for all of us regardless of what religion we claim. A special thank you to Geetha Auntie for all the wisdom she shared with us regarding this great spiritual figure. In reading about Jesus's life, we found that to know him is to love him. I've truly come to understand that when we talk about Jesus or any religious figure for that matter, we're really talking about Swami and vice versa. Interestingly enough, recently I went to visit a beautiful and large Buddha statue with some fellow YAs. I must admit to always being enamored with Buddha and always wanting to know more about his life teachings. I even wear a necklace that Ananda bought me with Buddha on it so that every day I can remember to be at peace. Um, and when I sat before Buddha as the monks were chanting, I tried to silence myself inwardly as much as I could. And within that silence, I heard Buddha say to me over and over again, my child, my child. Now, being the human that I am, I wanted to know the end of the sentence, my child what? Or I figured I was making this all up in my head through sheer want of being in communication with this form of the Lord. But the real takeaway here is that Buddha considers me his child, as Swami considers all of us his children. Similarly, only three weeks ago before we knew about this talk, Swami put it in my heart to start reading a book about Jesus. And wouldn't you know it, it was a book that my parents already had in their library. He has made my heart's desire to engage more with the lessons of Jesus Christ so accessible. Moments such as these can only be thought of as mere glimpses of the immeasurable love and grace of the Lord. He is guiding me to learn from all these spiritual figures so that I might have a greater understanding and fuller language to discuss and think about my own divinity in Swami. And engaging more with the beauty of other religions, we really start to drop all bias on what form of the Lord we worship and we can start to live in unity and diversity so that we can go to any temple or church or synagogue, what have you, and feel that we are children in that divine place. And that whatever the form or formlessness of the Lord we may be engaging with on that particular day, that God loves us for Swami is in all and all are in him. Lastly, I feel compelled to bring back the words of our beloved Swami here. To have Jesus awakened in us is called the path of jnana. Jesus was a messenger of God, but you should note this also. All of you are messengers of God. Jesus was not the only son of God. You are all his children. Jesus and his father are one. You and God are also one, and you can be aware of it. 
May we all follow the path of Jesus Christ and step into full awareness of our true union with God. We humbly offer all of what has been said at the divine lotus feet of our beloved Bhagavan in Christ. May we all continue to be the mere vessels for divine interactions and discussions. May we all be happy. Jai Sairam. Sairam.